I'm Igor Kefetz, and this is The List Building Lifestyle, the podcast for anyone who wants to build a wildly profitable email list working from home. If you'd like to make six figures, travel the world, and help people improve their lives in the process, this podcast is for you. I also invite you to claim a free copy of my best-selling book, The List Building Lifestyle, Confessions of an Email Millionaire, at igorsbook.com. Get the free book plus $3,000 bonus package that includes my best capture page templates, email swipe files, and traffic blueprints. Visit www.igorsbook.com for details. And now, it's time to claim your list building lifestyle. Welcome back to the list building lifestyle. I'm your host, Igor Kafetz, and today I'm excited to host a best-selling author of over 40 books, and someone you might have seen in the movie The Secret, Dr. John Demartini. Dr. John, welcome. Dr. Demartini, welcome uh, to the show. Thank you for having me. Appreciate the opportunity. Yes, I'm excited to chat. And um, uh, b- before we connected, you mentioned that you're independently free. Um, can you just share uh, with with the uh, list builders, with our audience, uh, what do you mean by that? Like, how can you, what is, what exactly does that mean? Well, I don't know if I use exactly the words independently free. I'm, I have financial independence, which means my passive income exceeds any active income with a multiple fold. So I work only because I love to, not because I have to. And I've been financially independent since age 37 and I'm 68 now. Wow. That's insane. That's uh wow. Now you, we're doing this uh, podcast. I'm doing it out of my basement home slash home office in Toronto, and uh, you're doing it on a boat. I live on a ship. For the last 21 years, I've lived on a large yacht, one of the largest in the world, and it is in Algiers right now. Uh, So in Algeria, Algiers, Algeria, and I'm there right off the coast here. And so I sail around the world full time, and I do presentations almost every single day. I I research, write, travel, and teach every day. I've been doing that since I was 17. That's been my dream. And I've been doing that all these years, 50 years now. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, uh, you know that saying that the happiest day in a, in a man's life is when he buys the boat and when he sells it. Is that, is that, does that ring true to you? Uh, no, I can't say that would be true. I, can't have a, I don't have a desire to sell the ship. Um, if I lived on a small little yacht um, and I was constantly having to maintain and do anything like that, but I don't have to do anything. Uh, it's all taken care of and it's in its first class. And so I really don't have any of those headaches that people with small yachts have. This is a, I've got a, a I have 309 staff. So there's a, there's a complete organization and people are doing things that make it a lot easier uh, than for me to be worried about stuff that many people on a small little boat has. Wow. That's incredible. Uh, 309. It sounds like you're on a cruise ship. Well, when people look at it, they think it's a cruise ship, but it's not. It's a private ship. There's 100 of us that own it. I'm one of the owners. So there's 100 of us that own this ship. And um, it's it's the best address I've been able to find on earth. I've said since I was uh, about 18, the universe is my playground. The world is my home. Every country is a room in the house and every city is a platform to share my heart and soul. So I've been on a mission to travel the world and to teach um, I've now been, I've taught now in 180 countries and I still got another 40 to go. So I'm still working on it. All right. Well, um, before we dive into it, one last question that's not related to the topic today. How do you get your mail? Mail pigeons? Um, I mean, does it get uh, drone dropped to you? Like, <laughs> I, I don't have any mail. I get emails. I, I have somebody that takes care of that. I've delegated everything. All I do is teach, research, write, and travel. Everything else has been delegated. I haven't driven a car in 32 years. I haven't cooked since I was 24. Uh, anything that I require, any form of extrinsic motivation to do, I delegate. And anything that I'm inspired to do, I do. And that's I, I've been trying to teach people how to do that so they can liberate themselves from a lot of baggage in life. And it's very simple, really. It's just giving yourself permission to pursue what truly is meaningful to you that you're spontaneously, intrinsically called to do and giving yourself permission to do it in a way that serves vast numbers of people and then delegate the rest away. And, it, and it's more simple than people realize and people make it complex. But uh, I don't have to worry about mail. I haven't seen mail, looked at mail or sent mail, you know, those basic things. I, but I do emails 
and I have a selective group of people that are able to get me on the email. Of course, and they're probably paying a ridiculous fee for that privilege. No, no, no. Some some are, some are. I mean, I do consulting and things, but these are my girlfriend. She can send an email. My director can send an email. My children can send. Email. <laughs> but uh, you know, I I don't um, I don't have just anybody just hit me on an email. But if they do, I'll either delegate it to somebody else or I'll respond if it's something that might be of value. Well, all right. Hear that, Nigerian prince? You still have a shot. All right, Dr. John. Um, and I'm, I apologize for calling you Dr. John and not Do Dr. Demartini because I'm from Israel. Uh, one of the countries where I come from is Israel. And over there, everybody calls each other by their first name. So when you talk to your doctor, you don't call them by the you know last name. It's uh, it's it's just a culture thing. So um, you've been you've now been in the self development space, Igor. I'm I'm coming to Israel. I'll be in Ashdod speaking there in November. So I'm I'm looking forward to come there. Oh, nice! I need to connect you uh, to my friend uh, Itai, who's uh, actually a big conference guy in Israel. Uh, so I'll I'll make sure to do that um, after after the podcast. Um, so you've now been teaching for writing, teaching. For about 50 years. I started in 1973. I started teaching in 1973. Well, the end of 72, early 73. And um, that was my dream to travel the world and teach. And yes, I've been writing books, uh, way more than 40 books. That's just self-help books. We've got 10 more getting ready to come out. I, I, I read and write every day and I speak every day. And that's the, I, I can't think of anything else I love better than that. That's what I love doing. Well, awesome. I mean, uh, didn't Jim, uh, was it uh, James Patterson who said that you're lucky if you find something you love to do and you're incredibly lucky if you also get paid for it. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm very happy for you. And, um, you know, in your 50 years of teaching, working with students, um, you also rub shoulders with pretty much every, every quote unquote guru, right? Out there. You've probably got exposed to Lots of people trying to achieve their dream outcomes, whatever that is. Now, in the context of our show, it will always be making more money while having more freedom, more free time, and more control over your life. And in the last 15 years of me doing this, um, although it it it's not you know 50, but it's still it's a bit you know it's a decade and a half. Um, I've spotted a pattern that I'm curious to hear your thoughts about, and the pattern is. There's no shortage of tools. There's no shortage of information. There's no shortage of help and resources, especially with the development and the acceleration of the internet, um, as to how to start your own business, how to make money. There's um, a new method to make money from your computer, or laptop, smartphone, etc., cetera, uh, being developed literally every single day. Um, some days, two or three methods. And yet, I still get emails from people who share their life story with me and um, who, who basically say something like, Igor, I've been trying to make money online or start my own business on and off for the last X years, five years, seven years, 10 years, 20 years. And, you know, they can't, they just can't seem to break through. Now, I'm curious, two questions. First, have you spotted anything similar in your experience? And second, if you did, um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Um, that's a very common thing. Every human being, regardless of age, gender spectrum, or culture, lives moment by moment with a set of priorities and values, things that are most to least important in their life. And this hierarchy of values is fingerprint specific to them. And although it's evolving through time, at any moment, it's specific to them. Every decision they make, every perception they take, every action they take is reflective of that hierarchy of values. Whatever's highest on that individual value system is an intrinsic value that they are spontaneously inspired from within to take action on. But as they go down the list of values, it becomes more extrinsic and it requires motivation where a reward or a punishment has to be implemented in order to get them to move and act. Motivation is a symptom, never a solution for human beings if they want to achieve. It's a symptom. And many people don't know their own hierarchy of values. They think they do. 
And as long as they live in the illusion of what it is and not know what it is, they will give themselves expectations to live outside what's truly congruent with what they value most. Let me give an example to clarify. I was speaking in a success summit with Richard Branson about 2013 in Johannesburg. And we had about 5,000 people there. And I started it and he ended it. And I got up and I said, how many of you want to be financially independent and wealthy? And all the hands went up, even feet went up in the air. And I said, great. Now, how many of you are financially independent? All but seven hands went down. Now, this is entrepreneurs. You would expect a higher percentage than that. And I define financial independence as a passive income exceeds active income. You don't have to work. You work because you love to. And all the hands went down. I said, now, I'm going to ask you something. It is interesting that less than 1% of the world's population make financial independence. And, but yet everyone in this room had their hand up. So that means 99% of you are living in a delusion. So I want to confront that delusion today. And I'm going to break that delusion. I'm going to show you why you have that delusion, how to dissolve it. But first, I'm going to point out that you got it because you want to believe it at first. Because our amygdala makes us want to be proud and wants to overlook that what's true about our lives. And that's what undermines our entrepreneur path. So I've got a question for you. If I gave you 10 million US dollars right now, big stack of, of, of dollars, and I said, you got 60 seconds to write down the 10 things you would do if I gave you that. I'm going to give you 60 seconds to write down what you would do if I gave you $10 million. It's yours in your pocket, but you got to write down what you're going to do with it. On your mark, get set, go. And in 60 seconds, I had them write down the 10 things they would do with that money. Okay, then I had now pass it to the guy on the left and let them calculate how many assets out of the 10 million is still there versus how much has been spent on consumables that depreciate in value. And most people were fluctuating between 20 and 80% of their money was gone in, in 60 seconds because they went out and bought that car. They bought that nice house. They bought those nice clothes. They bought that trip. They bought that little boat. They bought all those things that they thought were going to bring them success because it was externalized forms of success instead of meaning and well-being. And in the process of doing it, they end up squandering hard-earned cash. Now, if a person's only saved or invested 1% to 10% of their money over periods of years, that means it would take them, if they spent 80% of it in 60 seconds, that means it would take them, if they saved 10%, 100 years to get back to that at the rate that they've been doing it. So I explained to them that the hierarchy of your values dictates your financial destiny. Unless you know where financial wealth building really is on your things, on your, your hierarchy of values, you're going to have a fantasy that you want it. But the truth is you want the lifestyle of the rich and famous. You don't want to buy assets and be patiently letting them accumulate and defer gratification to build wealth. So the passive income buys you those things with a crescendo as you get older. You're wanting immediate gratification and costing you that, that return. And so what you say you want is not the truth. What you live, your life demonstrates what you really value. And a person has to understand what's truly demonstrated in their values if they want to know how, whether or not they're an entrepreneur. Because if they don't have the values that will lead them to entrepreneurship, they're going to flounder. So that's the first thing, waking up to the truth about what their hierarchy of values is. So we know that what they're committed to, because you spontaneously are committed and loyal and dedicated to what you value most. And if it's not going and serving people in sustainable, fair exchange with a product, service, or idea that's competitive and it's efficient and effectively delivered, then don't expect a fantasy. Hmm. That makes sense. That makes sense. When I started my business, making money was the highest priority, period. I mean, to a point where I would even try any kind of black hat technique just to get ahead. Um, and I've done some pretty, pretty stupid stuff along the way. None of it made money, but I did try it because I was my, you know, I wanted to make money more than anything else. Obviously, I didn't want to go to jail, even though I did spend some time in the army jail for being AWOL in the army. But um, it was, yeah, it was all about the money for sure. And um, let me, let's get a little bit, just, just some specifics around that. So what do you find tends to overtake the, the, 
the making money or building my business on the hierarchy of value? What values seem to go and get in the way there? Oh, it could be anything. There are seven primary areas in life that I divide life into, not because that's the fact, it's just an arbitrary thing that we created a model for. Um, the one could be your intellectual pursuit. You could have an academic pursuit and money is not really important. Uh, Freeman J. Dyson at the Institute of Advanced Studies that took over Albert Einstein's position, who I've spent many hours with, um, he never had focus on money whatsoever. He, was, he didn't care about it. He, it was the least of his concerns. He was academic. And so he's not going to end up wealthy. And he did not have any wealth of any form, financial wealth. He had wealth of knowledge because we have general wealth can be in any of the areas of life, but he didn't have financial wealth. I know people that have a high value on raising beautiful children and they're dedicated. Rose Kennedy, although married to her husband who made money, she didn't go out and make a business. Her highest value in her mission statement was to raise a family of world leaders. So her values was raising beautiful children. And that's a wealth accumulation. It's a wealth in the form of beautiful children that go out and do something extraordinary, but it's not financial wealth. You got other people that are really great at their physical fitness and they work out every day and they're in the gym every day, but they got no cash because they're focused on their own beauty and their own things. Unless they can turn it into some sort of training system and franchise it, it's not likely to build very fortune because they're spending eight hours a day in front of a gym. You may have something else that may be spiritual. Although I've met billionaires that are on spiritual paths, Ravi Shankar, who I've chatted with many times, uh, he's gone on to billionaireship from that. But many people are, are having this internal conflict, which is one of the reasons I wrote the book, uh, How to Make One Hell of a Profit and Still Get to Heaven, to break through that conflict that somehow spirituality and materiality aren't the same thing. The fact are they are. But some people have this idea that if I'm spiritual, I don't need material things. And that they have a value on that and they'll undermine financial well-being. You got others that are social. They they go out and socialize and meet all kinds of people, but and they suck up to people and they sacrifice and spend fortunes trying to meet people and hang out with people, but they don't have any way of having fair exchange. It's usually the p individual that has a high value on being of service to people, that has an entrepreneurial spirit that can leverage themselves, that and, and they have a value on money and they don't have an attachment to it. They're not infatuated with it and they're not resentful to it but they see it as a measuring stick of how that well they have fair exchange with people. Those individuals are usually the people that have the wealth. And I can spot them by doing a value determination process. On my website, I've got a value determination process and millions of people have used. And I can go in there and I can, I can determine what an individual's value system before they even know about it. And I can determine whether they're going to be an entrepreneur in the making or they're not. And, it, and we can narrow it down pretty quick. And I can tell you the ones that keep floundering, their values are interfering with the fantasy that they're holding. Hmm. That's really interesting. You know, as, as you say this, a couple of uh, a couple of people come to mind as well. You know, people who, who I hang out with who talk about making money a lot, think about it. We discuss it. They seem to be knowledgeable about it. But it's the, it's the uh, I would say, the taking action part that gets in the way. Um, in fact, you said something interesting. You said motivation is a symptom. That's I, I've never I've never heard anyone say that. Can you unpack this for us? Well, I've been studying human values forty five years, and extrinsic motivation is a symptom of not knowing what's truly intrinsically valuable to you and pursuing what's truly meaningful to you. And is is if you don't, you're going to need motivation constantly. I don't need motivation to teach, research, and write. I, if you can find anybody that's seen me need motivation 50 years for those three things, you got a free seminar as far as I'm concerned. You won't find it because I don't need motivation for those things. But I would need motivation. And anything I need motivation, I delegate. I learned that when I was 27 years old. Don't do desperate things. Don't do things that you require motivation because it's not intrinsic. Find somebody who's got their highest value, would love to do that, and they're masterful at doing it. They're greater at you at doing it. And put that person in place and let them do it for you. And you get on with doing what you're here to do and go and do it in a way that serves people. If you're going to do something that serves people and you structure it in a way that's in fair exchange and make a fortune out of it, you can afford to pay all those people to do all those other things. But don't sit down and do low priority things. Every time you do something low on your, your values into extrinsic values, you're automatically devaluing yourself. And so will the world. The world will create symptoms to let you know that. It'll show it up in your financial situation. Wow, that's really profound. Now, there's there's a bit that I would like to go even deeper with that. I'll give an example. So I'm uh, 34, 
and um, around the age of 25 or so, I've developed some some issues with my lower back. A disc slipped. I couldn't walk for two uh, about two weeks or so. It was a painful recovery, especially for me, like a guy in his prime, you know, breadwinner, entrepreneur, million dollar earner at the time, etc. It uh, it was very difficult for me. Now, of course, as soon as that happened. People started coming to me with suggestions and, and, and uh, advice about yoga, working out, stretches, chiropractors, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I followed it, some of it. Um, I've, I've got my back in shape and things like that. But you know what I found is I could never stick to, to an exercise routine. Like exercising always felt like it required, quote unquote, motivation for me. Like it wasn't you know necessarily something I... I I loved doing. It wasn't necessarily something I, I really couldn't, like I couldn't wait to do it. Um, it's not like I woke up in the morning, the first thing, jump out of bed, you know, put on my tracksuit and go jogging. No, it was very, very difficult to motivate myself. But I think I did it for about a year and a half before I quit. So what can you, what can you tell us about, about that? Like things we, I guess that we have to do because they're good for us. But at the same time, we just don't have the motivation to do them. Okay. Uh, you don't have to do anything. That's one thing. Uh, you're you're going to spontaneously pee and poo and you're going to breathe and things. That's about the only thing you have. Those are biological. But you don't have to do those things. But because have to is an implied extrinsic value system. Anytime you hear yourself saying, I have to do it. I got to do it. I must do it. I should do it. I ought to do it. I'm supposed to do it. I need to do it. It's an extrinsic source from an outside authority that you subordinated to. It's not intrinsically driven because when you have something intrinsically driven, you get up. I go, I love it. I don't got to do my my teaching. I love it. I do sometimes three to five podcasts in a day, and I'm teaching, doing seminars in between that, and I'm researching in between that. So I don't have, I don't need that. I don't need motivation. I but I if I had to go and cook, I would need motivation. That's why I delegate it. If I had to do it, drive a car, I would need motivation. That's why I delegate it. So. Exercise is not highest on your value. Being an entrepreneur may be way higher. Going and doing a podcast may be way higher, whatever it may be that's higher. I don't know enough about you to know what that is, but we could find out. So you have two choices. Either you delegate the exercise and have specialists come in there and you got, you know, uh, mermaids massaging your back and people stretching you and you're doing things like that and you take care of it that way and you go and do what you do that makes your income, which is the way I do it. or you take and readjust your value structure. Anytime you set a goal that's either not highest on your values, you got two choices. Redo the goal to match what's highest on your value and get grounded or change your values to match the goals. Now, how do you do that? Every decision you make is based on what will give you the greatest advantage or disadvantage at any moment in time based on the awareness that you have in your perceptions. So you're going to exercise. But if all of a sudden somebody said, okay, the benefit of your exercise is that 90% of the most successful podcasts on the planet exercise, or 95% of them are the leading podcasts that reach the most millions of people, they exercise. Okay, you might have a new association in your brain. If you found out that the, the 10 top billionaires all exercise, you might go, hmm, that, that now might make me different. If I see that doing exercise increases the probability of having the hottest women in the planet coming and wanting to be, be with you and, and take care of you and be, you know, in love with you or something like that, you might associate with it. If I stacked up enough associations, because I didn't associate anything with anything, stack enough associations where you started to see more advantage and disadvantage out of exercise and doing what you're doing now, I could in probably two hours, I could have you exercising by simply associations. So either go do what you love through delegating or love what you do through linking new associations in the brain to what you say you want to do. So you start doing it and you keep making the associations until the advantages outweigh the disadvantages and then you'll spontaneously do it. And you will no longer say, I got to do it. You'll say, I love doing it because it's getting me my dreams. I got a funny story. Okay. I'm in, I'm in Sydney, Australia and I'm at the, I think it's the Swiss hotel there on market street. And, um, I'm about to teach one of my signature programs called the Breakthrough Experience, which I've done 1,157 times now. And uh, there's about 300 people attending. And we have everybody outside and we get some music playing inside and they're all waiting to come in and we're going to let them in at the same time. 
And all of a sudden I walk in and, and put my, my little bag because I had some stuff in a bag and got my, my, uh, my lapel mic on and got ready to, to, to rock and roll. And in the front row, four seat over, was this hot babe that was sitting in the front. Normally we don't let them in, but somehow she snuck in and got in. And there was a guy about oh, five or six rows back that was chomping on a McDonald's something or other. I mean, he was gross looking. It was just, vroom, vroom, hurry up and eating before we started. And this girl comes in and she says, oh, Dr. Martin, I've been wanting to come to your break to experience for so long. I finally, you know, raised the money and got the money and I'm now here finally. I said, fantastic. And she said, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, I came here to find my soulmate. And I said, fantastic. And then I turned around for fun because I knew and she's got a fantasy like that. I'm going to have some fun with her. I said, what about the guy over here on the, in that, that row back there? So she turns around and looks back behind her shoulder and she goes, oh, God, no, 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 no. That's not my type. And I said, are you sure? And she said, no, oh, yes, I'm, that's definitely not my type. I mean, he's, ugh. and I, he was gross looking. He was, no way he was hot, not, she was a hottie. And I said, well, do you know who that guy is? And she goes, no. I said, you don't recognize him? No. She, I said, I said, that's one of the wealthiest billionaires <laughs> on the planet. We let him in here because we want to make sure he's incognito because everybody would recognize him and he bombarded out there and he's a celebrity and, and he's got, you know, massive yachts and, and planes and he hangs out with the A-list presidents, royalty, you name it. He was, he was dating Michelle Pfeiffer for a while and she felt that one of the biggest mistakes she made in life had stopped him because he was too dedicated to serving vast numbers of people. And I just built this guy up and stacked up all of her fantasies that I knew she had looking for a soulmate that 90% of the females have that caused him all kinds of problems. And I stacked them all up and everything else. And that, all this is as fast as I could do it in just a minute or two. And then when I finish, she goes, wow, I had no idea. Do you think you can introduce me to him? <laughs> man, that's, that's nice. That's nice. Oh, man. I, I, I would love to see the guy's face when she would walk up to him and be like, hey, it's you know, great, great to meet you. If, she, if I would, if that guy I had no idea what was coming, but all I know is I, I finally told her the truth. I said, look, I'm just teasing you. The guy's just a guy in there eating a breakfast Mac. I don't know how he got in here, but, but that's how easy associations can change. And I'm, I'm pretty masterful at helping people transform their association. I've been doing it for God knows how many years. And, and it's the quality of your life is based on the quality of the questions you ask. If you ask questions that make you conscious of what you're unconscious of. To be fully conscious, you can liberate yourself from a lot of impulses and in instinct distractions that most people undermine their achievements with. That's true. That's true. And I know we can't do your work justice in one podcast episode. So let me ask you two questions. Um, first, if somebody is already familiar with your work and you know they're ready to take things to the next level, what should they do and how they how, how should they work with you? And the second question is, if somebody who isn't familiar with your work, what would be a good way to kind of get introduced uh, to your philosophy, to your uh, to your methodology, to your um, to the uh, Dr. John D. Martini experience? Well, I don't I don't want to put in there should I take out the shoulds. Oh, okay, right. I don't want to impose uh, what somebody should do in their life. I do everything I can to help them become intrinsically driven, not extrinsically pushed. I'm not a, I'm not a persuader. I'm not a motivational speaker, as you can imagine. I'm an educator. Well, you're doing a great job motivating. And I try to educate people. <laughs> to well, I do what I can to inspire them to live authentically according to their values, not what they should according to what I think they ought to do. So what I do is I first direct them, usually to my website, to do the value determination process, process which is a complimentary private exercise that I've been working on and developed over the last 45 years to assist people in getting past the BS that they tell themselves about what they think is important and get down to what their life demonstrates is really important. That's a very crucial starting point. Because if, you know, if you're not, uh, everybody wants to be loved and appreciated who they are. And who they are is a reflection of what their highest values. Their ontological identity reflects it. Their epistemological pursuit and knowledge revolves around the highest value. Their teleological mission and purpose revolves around their highest value. Knowing what that is, is what 
I think is the most important thing I could contribute to somebody's life. So that's first. And it's free. It's on the off, it's on the website, drdmartin.com. If they want to go further than that, all they have to do is browse the website. There is enough information on there to keep them busy for multiple lives. They're going to have to be a Buddhist, almost believing in reincarnation, just to keep up with what's on there. There's that much information on there. They can go on there and find out the events where I'm at. They can go on and watch YouTube videos. There's just tons of stuff on there. There's go get books and products and stuff, whatever they want to do. Man. But that's the best place I could say to start there because that's where I spend most of my time. All right. Well, uh, you heard him, guys. So uh, you can go to uh, drdemartini.com. That's D-R-D-E-M-A-R-T-I-N-I.com. And you can check out what um, – uh, what he's got going on there, you can do the assessment, you can check out his books, his uh, videos, a lot of content free and paid, as well as uh, get more information about upcoming speaking events where uh, where Dr. Demartini is appearing and uh, lots and lots of other stuff. I mean, you can tell he's been doing this for 50 years. Uh, I got to tell you, I don't know if you classify yourself as a motivational speaker, but you're a great marketer of what you do. I mean, that line with the... Uh, with the uh, needing several lifetimes to go through all the content you've created. That's that's just brilliant. So I, I appreciate you taking the time to attend, knowing how busy you are. And um, I got to say, I, I admire what you've built. I admire um, the unapologetic um, life according to your own rules approach. It's like, if I'm not motivated to do it, I'm not doing it. And there's nothing you can do about it, right? It's just, it's incredible. I think that's empowering, that's inspiring. And um, thank you for sharing your wisdom today. And um, hopefully uh, we'll talk again soon uh, on one of the future episodes of the Lisbon Lifestyle. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. John. Thank you. You're the one helping me. So thank you. You're the one helping me help people. Well, my pleasure. My pleasure. So have a good one. Thank you for listening to The List Building Lifestyle. Get access to the previous episodes, transcript of today's show, as well as other exclusive content at listbuildinglifestyleshow.com. Also remember to claim your free copy of my best-selling book at www.igorsbook.com. It explains how I made millions with list building starting from scratch. Plus, I'll give you $3,000 worth of free bonuses, including my best landing page templates, email swipe files, and traffic blueprints. Go to www.igorsbook.com now to claim your free package.